Gospel of John, chapter 3. Put your hand up if you think that this is the most popular verse in the Bible. A lot of you. A lot of people. Now tomorrow and next week, I'm dealing with another one that is equally popular. Pastor Byron stole my other popular verse. God works all things together for good. Brother Graham, it's a hard verse when you've been through what you folk have been through. You say God's going to take this and work it together for good. Eh? Uh, but if that's what you pronounce with your lips. But this is one of the great verses of the Bible. My journey into faith. Now there was a Pharisee. What is a Pharisee? A Pharisee is a professional, professional person of faith. They were um, known by their dress code. They were known for their tempers. <laughs> um, in fact, today you call them, if you go to Jerusalem, you call them Hasidics. I remember once I was uh, on a tour and I was uh, staying in the center of Jerusalem and it was the hotel was in a Hasidic area and I went out. And you normally notice them by their beard and their curls down the side of their head and their hat. And, and all I did was ask them directions. I'm looking for a place to buy a Coke. And what they do is they spit on the ground. You're lucky they don't spit on you. They are so religious that it's pathetic to talk, answer a Gentile. And I just like suddenly realized I was in the wrong place at the wrong time. He was a Pharisee. A man named Nicodemus who was a member of the Jewish ruling council. This is what the young folk would call a main man. He came to Jesus at night, didn't want to be seen in the day, and he said, Rabbi, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God. No one could perform signs that you are doing if God were not with him. Jesus replied, Truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless you are born anew, born again, born from above. How can someone be born when they are old? Maybe that's your question this morning. How can I be born? Nicodemus asked, surely you cannot enter a second time into your mother's womb to be born? And Jesus answered, truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless you are born of water and the Spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh. The Spirit gives birth to Spirit. You should not be surprised at me saying you must be born again or from above. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound. You cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. How can this be? Nicodemus asked. Maybe some of you are right there today. How can this be? You Israel's teacher, said Jesus. And you don't understand these, that you can almost put in there, basic things. Very truly I tell you, we speak of what we know and we testify of what we have seen. But still you people do not accept our testimony. I have spoken to you of earthly things and you do not believe. How will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven. That is the Son of Man. And here's the verse I used at communion. Just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up. That everyone who believes may have eternal life. And here's the verse. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son that whosoever believes in him 
should not perish, but have eternal, everlasting life. Now, I trust one thing I'm going to do today is demonstrate to you a little bit just how the Gospel of John is written. For example, there are no parables in the Gospel of John. You find all the parables in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, but no parables in the Gospel of John. The way John writes is what we call narrative statement. He tells you a story, gives you a testimony, a narrative. And in this narrative testimony of Nicodemus, you can see where it's leading. And then you get a statement. And that's exactly what we have in front of us. For God so loved. Now you're going to miss it if you don't get that Greek word, agapao. Say to your neighbor, agapao. I'm talking Greek to you. Agapao is a sacrificial love for which you ask no return. Now, the young people all know the word philia. It's the, one, the Greek word where we get our word friendship. I do this for you, you do this back for me. I scratch your back, you scratch my back. Eh? I SMS you, I send you a message, I this, make sure you come back to that's how basically you love works. When it comes to marriage and all that, there's another word where we get our word erotic, eros. But this is a unique word, and you know it's only related to God. You don't find it in extra biblical literature, it's all related to God. God gives without expecting return. Do you know that God would have given his son even if one of you never believed? Just think of that. The fact is we have. That's the greatness of this love. He loves the cosmos. That's where we get our word, the cosmos. He's so that he gave his only begotten, unique son. This is the son which we think of at Christmas time. That whosoever believes in him should not perish, but gain eternal life. I want us to look at this story of a journey into faith. And you know, we've all got journeys into faith. We can all testify here this morning of the place we're at, the place we've been, the place we're at, the place we're going. And we've all got a story of a journey. And that story has got ups and downs to it. Well, here's the story of a man by the name of Nicodemus. He's reached the highest actual, uh, um, uh, standards of life. He has been admitted into the top leading uh, body of Israel. He has got all the accolades. He has got all the titles. He has got everything that he wants. And Jesus says, you are a teacher of Israel. You are a professor of Israel, but you don't understand the basics. Let's click on to the next slide. I want you to notice something very special that happened. He became attracted to Jesus. Now, this is a major problem when you've put all your eggs in one basket or you've climbed a ladder and discovered you've got to the top of the ladder and the ladder's against the wrong wall. Problem, problem. I've discovered I've got a problem. It became attractive to Jesus. I've just been reading some biographical material and just recently I've been reading the biography of the surgeon, the former Surgeon General of the United States of America. And he had become a very, very notable doctor. He had got his PhD within medicine and he was a very good uh, a doctor. And he tells the story of his restlessness and he used to go along to where somehow uh, they just didn't explain the gospel. And one day he said to his wife, I need to go to the church, the, the church next door, and maybe I'll find there. And he went into that church. And what happened, he said, I became attracted to Jesus. And Dr. Coop, they used to call him Chicken Coop. Chicken Coop. Dr. Coop, he was actually a Dutchman. He came from Holland. 
and he was Dr. Quip, but they used to call him Chicken Coop. And he used to try and rid himself of this, this uh, nickname that was given, but to his dying day, people stuck with it, his friends stuck with it, and they called him Chicken Coop. But he was, he said, somehow I became attracted to Jesus. And he said, that changed my life. He said, suddenly I realized my life was not just medicine, my life was the purposes and the plans of God. And that's what happens when you're attracted to Jesus. Basically, two things attracted Nicodemus. The one was the authoritative teaching of Jesus. This wasn't just book knowledge. It wasn't just academic knowledge. It wasn't just completing exams. It was an authoritative knowledge. And he says in verse 2, Rabbi, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God. In Matthew 7, verse 28, and it says, And when Jesus finished these sayings, the crowds were astonished at his teaching because he taught them as one who had authority and not as the scribes. This wasn't just information. This was discipleship. This was God says, this was God says, this was God says, this was you say, but I say. And he was attracted by the authoritative teaching of Jesus. The second thing that attracted him was the miraculous ministry of Jesus. It says in verse 2, no one can do these signs. Now, for those of you that are listening here, the word sign is a word like pointer. Morkel Street. It's a sign that points you to a street. This word, semeon, it is a sign. It points to something. It's not just making the blind see. It's not just making the deaf hear. When the deaf hear, it's a pointer to God. When the blind see, it's a pointer to God. When somebody is born again and they come out of depression and despondency and they begin to live a life, it's a pointer to God. And Nicodemus says, I see a pointer. You get it? Imagine. You're a teacher of Israel, you've got all the accolades, and among all your colleagues, they never see a miracle. They are all paid professor's salaries. Can you imagine, this man says, I don't know what it is, but at our last discussion, it says, we, not just me, all know that you've come from God. Isn't it wonderful when you get attracted to Jesus? That's what happened to Dr. Crook, Surgeon General in the United States of America, force of American medicine at his hands and his fingertips. And he said, when I saw Jesus, I was attracted to him. Second thing I wanted to show you in this journey is that he gets answered by Jesus. I find it very interesting that Nicodemus has many questions, just like you. You know, if I went around this room here today, each of you would have a question that you would like answered. Auntie Wendy and I were just talking yesterday. I've got a question in my mind right now. Why is my sister suffering in hospital, in of hospital, out of hospital, prayer, comforts, encouragement, just about to see her lift and back down. I've got questions. Why can't I see my sister rise up right now? And I think Brother Graham and Shirley and the family, why could people come into our home with uh, armor and guns and knives? And uh, I mean, you just, you just have questions. But I want you to see that Jesus answers certain questions that comes to him. And Jesus says in verse 3, three it's Truly I say to you, unless you are born again, unless you are born from above, 
you cannot see the kingdom of God. Verse 5, unless you are born of water and the Spirit, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. And look, Nicodemus laughs. Do you mean to say that I, as an adult, 40 plus years of age, must go back into my mother's womb and be born? You see, he's, he's trying to be funny. I think he's a great evangelist. Uh, not all he's known in Africa as much as he's known in the rest of the world. Died just a few years ago in his 90s, Dr. Billy Graham. And of course, his whole message was, you must be born again. And what it happens to some people, it irritates people. And one day, this man walked up to Dr. Billy Graham and said to him, Dr. Billy Graham, why does the Bible say I must be born again? And Billy Graham said to him, because you must be born again. <laughs> you see, Jesus just cuts to the, cut, to the chase. He's not going to argue the point. Nicodemus, you've seen the kingdom in me. If you want to be part of the kingdom, you must be born of the Holy Spirit. Friends, the Lord Jesus comes to us today and he answers the question, must I enter into my mother's womb? Of course, I mean, stop being ridiculous. You can't enter again into your mother to be born, but what you can do is your spirit can be born again. That which is dead in you, your mother gave birth to flesh, my spirit gives birth to spirit. And those whose spirits are dead, what I can do is revive you. You can suddenly see the kingdom of God. You can suddenly hear the birds singing. You can suddenly see the beautiful pictures of life. You can suddenly see the things where life seems to be so dark and dreary and troublesome. When you are born again, you can actually say, this is the day the Lord is made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. Third thing, in your journey, which I think is incredible, is the assurance that comes to Jesus. You know, there was a preacher who went around America. He became um, one of the presidents of the Southern Baptist Convention, which is a president of about 16 to 18 million people. And after his two years in office, and what was the biggest problem that you found? You know what he said? Lack of assurance. Lack of assurance. And I wonder here today if there's perhaps just a, a lack of assurance. And what I want to do is to encourage your assurance of what the Lord Jesus has for you. I want you to hear the words of verse 8. The Spirit blows where it wills, and you hear the sound of it, but you don't know where it comes from or where it goes to. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Isn't that wonderful that the Lord Jesus can give you such wonderful assurance, assurance of knowing him and assurance of coming to faith in himself. And it says in John chapter 1 verse 12, but to all who received him, to those who believe in his name, he gives power to become children of God. 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 13, For by one Spirit we were all baptized into one body. John 3 verse 6, That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the Holy Spirit is spiritual. 1 John 4 and verse 13, By this we know, Say to your neighbor, I know. Say to your other neighbor, I know. This we know, that we abide in him and he in us because he has given us the Holy Spirit. Sometimes, especially in the Gospel of John, there are little clues. And the clues are hidden in fine little Greek, simple language, very simple language, by the way. And what it does, it uses the capital S and the small s word, which in Greek is actually P. It's the word pneuma, pneumatic. When you pump a bicycle, pneumatic. That is, you're pumping 
um, wind and um, into a tire. So what he says is, the spirit, big P, big S, blows into our spirit, small p, pneuma, small s, English, so that we suddenly realize the living God of the kingdom of God is breathing into our spirits and you come alive. All things can happen now. You can open your Bible and the same spirit that inspired the scriptures is the same spirit that is in you suddenly understand the Bible for yourself. That's called inspiration. I just believe this morning the Lord wants to give perhaps assurance to all who receive him. Say to your neighbor, all. Say to your neighbor, it includes you. To all who received him, to all who believe in his name, he gives the power, the right, the privilege <laughs> to what? And when you are children, you're part of a family, part of a kingdom. When you are children, you are part of the will. So that when one inherits, the other one inherits, and we become joint heirs with Jesus Christ. Can you see where this is taking you? The fourth and the last one, which deals with the communion we dealt a little bit earlier, is the atonement which Jesus gives to us. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. What Jesus is doing is taking us back to Numbers chapter 21 and verse 9. People were dying of a plague. And what happened was Moses lifts up this bronze snake and he says anyone who would dare look at it and believe in God's power would be saved and be healed. I was visiting um, an art lover once. Somebody who had all kinds of art. And he was showing me around his house and... Uh, he had this kind of art and this kind of art and I was a little confused and I was looking and I was saying to him, what is this? Because you know with art you're not always sure. And then I said to him, like, what is this? And eventually he said, you know Martin, you're an absolute skeptic. I'll tell you what you do. Stand back and say, this is the best view you've got of my whole lounge. Stand back and just look. So I stood and he said, what do you see? I said, nothing much. <laughs> he said, carry on looking. And eventually I discovered what the art, as I looked, I began to interpret. And I said, is this, he says, you're starting to see. You know, friends, sometimes all Jesus says is look. Look again. Look again. That's why I got you to look at this communion. Look, 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 look until you see. You know what you will see? Let's go to the last slide. This is what you will see. God so loved the cosmos. God's love is pouring out toward you. Everything else, Satan is trying to tell you, God doesn't care, God doesn't love you. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. How do I know? It's because of his son. How do I know? It's because of the cross. How do I know? Because of the resurrection. How do I know? Because he has actually gone and given me the Holy Spirit. Whosoever believes in him should not perish have everlasting life. 
Last night I was talking to some friends and he said to me, Ah, by the way, I met a friend down in Cape Town. He said, Do you know what? He's got a church of gangsters. I said, Sure. He says, It's beautiful. He said, I went to a nice suburban church and they said, But you play the, you play the, uh, the guitar. Uh, uh, you can't just sit in church. You better go out to this fellowship and play in the worship team. And when he got there, he said he discovered there's a church of gangsters. I mean, I got down there at one particular time, and I uh, normally have a higher car, and this time I had to go to something else, so I got them to pick me up. And after I'd been there, uh, I said to them, could somebody take me to the airport? And the guy said, sure. He said, um, those three ex-hijackers will take you to the airport. <laughs> so the guy came up to me, the, the, the oldest guy, he's a very regal sort of guy, he came up to me and he said, Pastor, I'm learning on the side. Everybody's doing something on the side. He said, I'm learning on the side to do a little bit of tourism, and there's a combi bus. If you'll just give me 150 rand, I can actually hire that combi bus. So I said, okay, I gave him 150 rand, and he went and hired the combi bus from the owner, and uh, the three ex-hijackers, ex-con men had come out, and they put me in the combi first, where there's no door. <laughs> and there's one driving, one in the back seat, and one next to me, and we're driving down to the airport, and I see the word Kailicha, Kailicha, and I suddenly think of those murders in Kailicha. I'm thinking to myself, what if he takes Kailicha <laughs> and not the airport? <laughs> you see, I was going through a crisis of faith. I couldn't believe for a short moment that God can rescue. I was so pleased when I saw International Airport. <laughs> and as we drove in, the one guy is sitting next to me, <laughs> and they were asking me all sorts of questions. And I mean, even discipleship can become... The one guy next to me, and he says to me, Hey, pastor, he says, man, I've never seen the, I've never seen the inside of an airport. Will you take me in the airport? And I'm thinking, is this a con trick now? That <laughs> so I said, come on, come with me, man. Take my baggage, and, and off we go. And I showed him the inside of Cape Town Airport. I thought I must get him back to the combi. And I took him back and he got in. And I said, Yo, thank you, Lord. <laughs> you see, I was going through a crisis of faith. I got in the plane and I said, Lord, I'm ashamed of myself. You rescued those guys. You loved those guys. You redeemed those guys. You've changed their lives. Unless you're born again. You see, those are the journeys of faith. I didn't come through being a hijacker. They have. I didn't come through murdering. One of them has. But God has taken them. And my friend has this big thing. We don't, we do regeneration. We only do regeneration of people here. We don't just do um, a re-education of people. We do regeneration. And I was put through a crisis by putting put into a combi with three hijackers. <laughs> and I want to tell you something. What a wonderful story these guys have got. And last night, my friend shared with me, he said, oh, Martin, did you hear, have you heard those guys preach? I said, sure, I've heard them preach. I've seen a lot more than you've seen of them. I actually saw them in their prison cells before they got out. And when they come out, they say, thank you, pastor, for visiting us <laughs> in prison. And you visited me. You. Lord Jesus, we're all on a journey this morning. I just pray we would hear the words, unless you're born again, you cannot see, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for saving my brothers and sisters here today. And thank you that we can rejoice in the Lord. Can you all say amen?